Hi, welcome to lesson four um, with Nonprofit Human Resources. This lesson is going to be focused on employee performance management. Now, many of you have uh, been a part of receiving employee evaluations. Some of you may have given them. We're going to um, try to train you on some of the best practices with that. And I'm here with Andy Kreiner, who is a nonprofit human resources consultant. So Angie, um, help get us started on performance management. All right, thanks. Hey, first of all, I wanna say that um, I don't talk to too many people who love this, either as a giver or as the receiver. This is um, a function that does serve a purpose and is actually important, but I think definitely is um, bear some additional opportunity for creativity, innovation, and maybe effectiveness. Historically, performance appraisals have been done once a year, and they can be cumbersome because uh, organizations tend to do them one of two ways. They do them all at the same time of year. So if someone has you know, uh, 15 people in their department, they suddenly have to spend 15 time to, to get 15 performance appraisals done all in a given 15 day period or month period, and it becomes really cumbersome. Uh, it also tends to be tied to money, so it can breed a performance behavior in employees. If employees all know that July is performance appraisal month, <laughs> then many employees will consciously or unconsciously just absolutely rock it in May and June because July is performance appraisal month, um, which can tend to lead to an inequitable feedback because the recall is going to be most recent as opposed to throughout the past 12 months. The person conducting the appraisal often gets overwhelmed. And so what happens is it's just kind of diminishment. You know, they have to get them done. Uh, it becomes very tedious, honestly, within that, that process. Now, I have seen some other organizations move from everything gets done at the same time each year to doing performance appraisals for individual employees on their anniversary date. And that is helpful to some degree because then a person is in an environment where feedback is a more, the formal feedback is a more regular thing. And so they tend to be a little more equitable because every month they might have one or two rather than this month I've got 12. So the history um, ha has led itself to be somewhat cumbersome. I do wanna say that there is an importance to doing them. Um, specifically, it's important to document issues, both uh, positive and for correction. Documentation in the HR world is a non-negotiable. I mean, it's gotta be there. And it's very important to make record of what an employee does performance related, behavioral related, that is positive and or needs correction. When push comes to shove and say an organization wishes to part ways with an employee, if they say, well, and I get these calls, we want to let this person go, you know, their, their attendance hasn't really been good anyway, it's a problem. I'll say, great, do you guys do performance evaluations? Yeah. Okay, pull those. What does it say? Does it ever note that there has ever been an issue with attendance for this person. And they say, well, no, it says that they meet expectations. Okay, is there any other documentation anywhere that has notated that their attendance is unacceptable? Well, no, not really. Well, guess what? That's how you end up in a wrongful termination suit. Because in concept, if an employee is not made aware that something is substandard or needs correction, and then they're their employment is lost because of it, the basis is that actually a failure to communicate that something is substandard is a default that it's acceptable to the employee because they have no reason to think that whatever that is has been less than acceptable. So documentation is really important. I think it's also important because it helps to clarify those expectations. So in a performance eval, both what they're doing well and what could could or need some improvement when laid out. And then behind it, you put some goals or an action plan as to what that's gonna look like. It gives clarity and purpose to something that is not as it should be or is exactly as it should be. It's just as important to say, hey, 
your monthly reports are fantastic. This is exactly what I need in this reporting. Then they know, oh, I should probably continue to do that. So on both sides, clarity, documentation and clarity is really critical. The third is a career path. Um, and then finally an engagement piece. People will feel inclusive. They will, if they understand that there's direction within the organization, that they add value to the organization, then they will continue typically to perform well, to care and to be involved in the productive aspects of that organization. So performance evaluations from that perspective are critical. I do also wanna say that at most organizations practically or otherwise, they tie into increases in compensation. And so you want to have documentation and accurate documentation so that when you are um, taking a look at the whole of the organizations and how to pass out uh, salary increases, you do so using documented information and not just from an emotional basis or an immediate recall of recent performance, good or bad. Yeah, that, that's really helpful. And I mean, how I use performance evaluations as an executive director or president um, is, you know, I, I view you set the initial expectations, um, you know, in orientation and onboarding, then, you know, you're doing kind of like the day to day, you know, more tactical issues during the one to one check ins. But, you know, how do you reset you know, the one year expectations, it's, it's kind of a routine that you just have to do. And, and the other thing is, there's a lot of people who are motivated, you know, like if we just did class or, or courses at City Vision without grades, um, then people would be less motivated. And, and part of what it does is it makes it clear that there is some accountability built in here. You know, if we just said, read the books, you know, do the assignments, there's no grades and everyone gets an A. Um, you know, I have a feeling people wouldn't you know, do the, the work as hard. And, and part of it is like, I view myself through the lens of a coach and, you know, my best coaches, um, they always challenge me to run harder and faster and, you know, mm -hmm. be a better person. And I think that's ultimately what a good performance evaluation does is it plays that role, role of a coach to say, um, you know, you're, you're doing great. And here's, you know, how you're going to do even better, um, you know, mo moving forward. And um, yeah, so th those are some of the ways I, I use it. Um, yeah. So let, let... To use your analogy, Andrew, too, like, you know, running the race and so forth. When you run a race, you always know when the race ends. You know where the finish line is, whether it's cross country or sprint. And that is so essential. And that, that is another thing that really that evaluation or that performance eval should do. This is what the standard should look like, you yeah. know. So that's critical, great analogy. All right, performance management, especially in a ministry and other nonprofit, um, you've, you have to include and prioritize mission statement, core values and culture. That should absolutely be a core part of the evaluation tool. And the behavior should support and reinforce those values. We've talked about that before, but again, if you're gonna measure it, you have to be able to explain it in a way that's measurable. Yeah, and I would just say, honestly, I think this is probably the biggest difference between um, faith-based organizations and secular businesses. You know, secular mm -hmm. businesses, they'll have their, their values, um, but, you know, how much is it weighted in terms of the performance evaluation? Right. Usually it's weighted very little, um, and, you know, the job description com components um, are, are much more, and a lot of faith-based organizations, this is weighted a lot heavier. Um, so I, I'm glad that you're you're going to talk about that more in detail and, and how how you actually do that. So right. So these are a couple examples of values for an organization. One is fosters trust and teamwork. And so really the push for the organization is what does that look like? Well, it looks like maintaining confidentiality. It looks like openly communicates is edifying and appropriate. Uh, honors established leadership, upholds and adheres to ABC policies and standards, and is a team player. And by that, is supportive, cooperative, and collaborative. So if that is how the organization uh, defines, fosters trust and teamwork, then that is the measure by which should be, that the individual should be evaluated within the performance of L. Um, dignity of the individual. Now, often we think about that core value as towards those we serve, but the reality, and Andrew mentioned this earlier, it's not just towards those we serve. It's toward each other. It's toward our direct reports. It's toward 
our, our higher ups, it goes all the way through. So what does that look like? Dignity is expressed by good listening. You're a good listener, a compassionate responder. You're considerate of others, gracious in interactions and fair. And so that is the definition of how we how this organization would express dignity. And this is what we're talking about. Take the time to take those values and then define what they mean practically within the workplace and include this in the performance of L. Some notes on employee feedback is that uh, if you go back to the uh, subject that we talked about last week on employee interactions and laying that foundation of trusted relationships, then when you establish feedback as a normal aspect within the culture, you facilitate a more authentic and beneficial related conversation and outcomes. Um, people are, are used to it. It's not like this, uh-oh, you're in big trouble. It's a normal part of giving feedback, receiving feedback. When you are giving feedback to an employee, information really has to be specific and relevant. Okay, to Andrew's point, you know, the 010 is if something comes up, don't wait four months for the annual performance evaluation to let somebody know that something they did four months ago should have been done different or could have been done different or whatever the case is. It needs to be specific, relevant, timely and usable. So you don't wanna hold those things and add them all up and dump them then. You need to address them on a regular basis. And we'll talk about this a little bit more and Andrew's already mentioned this. If you have one-on-ones as well as team, part of both of those meetings that are scheduled and upheld regularly should include feedback and exchange. And they should include things like, does anyone have anything to add that, would, that they need from the team this week? Does anyone need help with anything carrying out? Does anyone wanna share a situation or a scenario that they would like to have some ideas or some feedback from the team on? And to be able to complete those types of feedback exchange where people are both giving and receiving will again, make the notes specific to the performance of when you need to do it, one, more accurate, more usable, more relevant, and more beneficially and readily received. So schedule for frequency and solicit employee feedback. And again, don't, that's basically what I was saying. Don't just do this once a year, make it a regular part. Um, and again, reinforce the why more than just the what. This is a, an interesting concept, I think, that, that is more um, true, again, in a ministry organization rather than a corporate world. People are held accountable for their behaviors, for the choices they make. I say this often, and I've even said it to my kids. You can think anything you want, but the minute something comes out of your mouth, you're going to be held accountable for that. The minute you take action based on what's floating around in your head, you will be held accountable for that. Now it could be fine and it could be great and it could be encouraged, but it could also be not. So it's important then to understand that the, the behavior ties back into the why. So if it's something that's not okay, why is it not okay? It needs to tie back because it's contrary to the mission statement. It's contrary to the, the value of fostering trust and teamwork among team. It's, it's contradictory to our conflict of interest policy. It's so that's, that's an important part of the connection and in the frequency of meeting with people, number four is just critical. It's critical to establish. Yeah, that's great. An alternative to an only annual performance eval, and if it hasn't been clear already in recent weeks, I'm not a fan of just once a year feedback. I think especially in um, ministry organizations, that's a killer. <laughs> it's not enough. So I think that it's really important that if you're going to have an anniversary one, or a, I'm sorry, an, an annual one that you need to determine whether you are going to do it once a year for everybody or on an anniversary date. You know, you have to ascertain which one works. Now, I will be honest and say that I don't think it really matters, provided you do feedback year round. Okay, either one of those can work if you provide regular feedback on an ongoing basis. I also am a huge fan that for the annual performance eval that you incorporate a self-evaluation component and we provide some templates. So we'll go over that at the end of this session, but it is important that you purposefully, proactively solicit feedback and it becomes part of the eval. Um, and the third part is goal setting. 
My suggestion is that as you go through an annual performance eval, minimally, you set a goal setting meeting that is either going to be a status of what was uh, set at the six at the annual performance eval, or the annual performance eval is actually the six month checkup from the goal setting, which happens apart from the performance eval. So there's a couple of different ways to do it. We've provided some templates toward that. And the goal setting really should, should apply to two things. Ideally within goals, you want to not only set them with and for the individual employee, but for the department as well. Because it, it when you set those departmental and those team goal setting, it creates often roles for individual employees to uphold that then benefit the whole team. It also should increase engagement. Um, and it should also breed, you know, those feedbacks about accountability and inclusive, inclusivity and um, feedback, both giving and receiving. When you have goals that the group is working on together, there is a greater uh, motivator to provide feedback, to provide and to work with people from a collaborative and an accountable standpoint when collectively those goals are going to be measured. So, so Andy, let's, you know, let me talk about it more specifically. So like say an organization does its performance evaluations in the summer um, or say like in June, and then sure. it, it does it's, you know, usually most organizations will have like a longer term strategic plan, but then they'll have an annual kind of tactical, you know, strategic plan or something. Um, so is essentially what you're saying is they would do their performance evaluations in the summer and then someone might set their their individual and department goals like you know in November December for the following year and then those would be used as a part of the evaluation 6 months later or how does how does it all work like using this specific example and yeah some dates I kind of depends a little bit on the type of goal setting that you do. In other words, for an, a performance evaluation, there's typically an action plan that does address certain things that may arise in the individual employee's behavior or performance um, that needs to be addressed related to their specific job then and now. And that is different than actual goal setting, but there can be some crossover. So when we look at those templates, I think that part will be a little clearer. On the flip side, let me say this, that goal setting is not always most effective at the time of annual performance appraisals because they compete for time and energy. And so to do an individual performance eval, say in June of everybody, and then to do goal setting, say in November or January, wherever it works for you, then these things should be uh, symbiotic. They should feed one another. So in part, the goal setting that is part of the strategic plan. So say the board is set up and the, the executive director is set up that this year, these are the five things that we're going to focus on as an organization for this coming year. That is more of a goal setting lead as opposed to a performance appraisal lead in terms of how that's going to play out. So I, I don't know if I cleared that up for you very well practically but it depends somewhat on an action plan. And I tend to use that term more, ties directly into the performance appraisal when individual information or, or um, behavior needs to be improved and there's yeah. direct correlation versus goal setting right. that is more enhancement or expansion, um, uh, you know, uh, we're, we're, we're growing beyond. It's that investment piece or that attainment piece that affects both the individual and the department, not only or exclusively related to their individual performance appraisal. So is this goal setting at six months, are you saying that that is um, not as much like the corrective action that might happen yeah. in a performance evaluation. Right. Like you, you got to fix these three things. It's going to be more like tied to the strategic plan or tied to yes. the, the individual's contribution into that. So, okay. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, that, yeah. I think that makes a lot of sense. And honestly, I've run into that problem because we get through the performance evaluation and then it's kind of like you get people to the finish line and then you say, Hey, let's go run 10 more laps. <laughs> they're kind of they're done, you know? So yeah. that's actually helpful. I think I might start doing that. So, okay. Yeah. All right. Um, 
the the other parts of that are again we've talked about this so i'm going to hit it pretty hard or pretty quickly set monthly meetings or more frequent meetings with employees and and as the manager the one-on-ones or the group the team meetings take notes and file them for yourself i mean these are not the kind of things that go to the official hr personnel file file them for yourself and you want to keep you know how's the employee doing within their job write down what the employee needs to do has done or has accomplished and if you give them something to focus on specifically before the next one on one the meeting and again asking for that in, for that feedback what do you need from me do you have everything you need um, to to do what we've talked about is there anything that i can do for you or on your behalf do you need any resourcing any equipment anything to make sure that this happens um, same thing with the departmental meetings you want to ensure that it, at, at those check-ins, and Andrew, you talked on this, that a lot of it is tactical, functional, operational, day-to-day. -day. Include the attachment to all of that busyness to the goal setting. It needs to tie in. How are we doing? So last month, we said we were going to tackle this thing because if in 12 months we need to be here, then we want to have broken that out into maybe by quarter. So how are we doing? And note the progress, any revisions, any assignments that were given to team members. Keep notes on that. You need to do that because when you sit down at the annual, you should sit down and review the whole year. So you've got a really good solid understanding about where things are. Um, and again, from the frequency, th if you do these things, sitting down to do that annual performance eval will take a fraction of the time and will be a, a fraction as stressful <laughs> because now you're pulling from this information that puts everything really into context. Okay, great. Um, as it says, when it's time to do the eval, you want to pull all those notes from department and both um, in, in the individual and the departmental notes. You'll have a more realistic picture about how the employees done this last year. And this approach also facilitates open and regular feedback, thus minimizing surprises, which none of us like. Um, it also has that intentional component to build team, which again, the stronger your team is, the more likely they are to solve problems, to innovate, to do more absent your entire guidance. Um, I'm not sure who this the credit belongs to, but there are four common stages when you're building a team and it's forming, storming, norming, performing. So, you know, the more that we can get that connected for them, the better off that becomes. So. Okay, that's great. All right, this is kind of that action plan that I mentioned earlier that should be part of an individual or annual performance evaluation. The action plan is really related to something that needs improvement. So on the duties and responsibilities, if you can see that section, that box, if this is a direct result of something that is substandard or needs improvement, then you want to mark that. If this is um, something that got carried over from last year's evaluation, uh, say there's an issue with attendance and this year it really did not sufficiently improve, then you want to note that as well because that gives you now at a glance that this is not a new issue, but this is an issue that has now gone on for a while. You may also want to put forth something in order to improve one of the other two things. So you may choose, um, I'll give you an example, had, an, had a, a, an organization, a rescue mission hire an RA and they hired a resident assistant for, who was a program graduate prior fantastic, had all the relational skills, um, had graduated, there was some time and distance between graduation and employment, was really advocated for by the manager of this um, department. Great, got this person in and realized this person did not have a lick of computer skills, which it was almost so obvious that they just missed it. So in this case, there's definitely a needs improvement because this person literally can't do some of the core functions of the job. But in this case, it would warrant putting forth something else by the supervisor. Um, and in this case, it's you've got to go take some computer classes, you know, in order to really be effective because the needs improvement can't happen unless something else is put forth by the supervisor that's going to enable that needs improvement to happen. So then from there, what you want to say in that case would be um, must master the ability to 
uh, use the computer to accomplish the following. Log your time is going to be one of the fundamental things because in this organization, they have a, a electronic or computerized time system. Uh, record case notes within Spiro because they happen to use that as their case note system. Be able to research information and be able to refer individuals based on you know, the internet searches that you find for referral and advocacy. So what will the employee do and what will the supervisor do or the organization do to facilitate that? This is that type of action plan that includes goals or objectives but are separate from the strategic or the organizational goals or objectives that are set forth separately. Yeah, okay, that's okay. great. Um, it's important to understand the importance of the need for the goal or objective and again, in what I just said in that example, this person has to understand that a portion of their job literally can't be done, which means that it, it diminishes the services that can be provided to the people that are served. And so from that perspective, it's important to tie that back in. Um, it's a quality of service, it's a stewardship and an accountability issue. The follow-up is the biggest challenge and usually where things go wrong. My suggestion is at the time that you are setting up an action plan, that is also the time you build in and you schedule your follow-ups, okay? Because otherwise it just gets lost and it, and it doesn't have to be huge, but it needs to be relevant to the job or to the goal or the objective. So if in this case I need Susan to take computer classes, then I need to set up and say, I need you enrolled or I need you to provide me with the information relevant to, to take those computer colleges computer course at the junior college, I need that by the end of the month, then you need to set up the, the check-in time accordingly. Does that make sense? So as you move through it, it, it's always being set up before the next meeting ends. Yeah, that's great. Okay. When setting goals, it's, it's important, again, to improve in an area that's currently functioning below what's needed and to engage and motivate the employee toward more. Not all goals should be employee generated. Um, and by that, it's kind of interesting. I've worked with organizations that are all over the place on this, but inevitably when an organization wants to open it up to kind of whatever the employee wants, it sounds like a great idea, but practically it kind of leaves them going, okay, yay you, you know, because literally employees have put up, I really want to learn how to be a better gardener has nothing to do with their job or the ministry or anything else. And so you've got to kind of um, uh, put some parameters, I think, around that. But it, it's got to be something that can be supported by the ministry or that's ministry affiliated, um, that, that meets a need, that, that's an investment to the employees, even if it's not in their current job. So I've got um, a gentleman who's over uh, facilities at a given organization but he really wants to get increasingly involved in programs. And so one of the goals that was set forth by him and that they're, the organization's working with is he is taking some uh, courses toward accreditation, maybe through City Vision for drug and alcohol certification counseling, because he wants to run support groups for people um, that work on that side of programs. Doesn't have to do with his current job, but it absolutely is an investment in the employee that should keep him engaged in the organization and the ministry beyond his current role. And then finally, SMART is just a really common acronym and goal setting, but it really does help when you teach employees how to set goals and then work with them. They should be specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and time-based. And missing any of those pieces is really going to drive you guys a little bit crazy. Great. So I realize a lot of this can seem um, a little, you know, more general principles. Let's let's get down to some of the nitty gritty. And um, in this week, we have several templates um, that you can uh, use. And, uh, you know, a lot of your organizations are, are going to have performance evaluation um, templates that, that you use. Some of them won't. Um, and you can, you know, use these to build your own. Um, you don't want to just copy another organization's performance evaluation, partly because of the, the evaluation, I, I mean, the, the tie within your um, mission and values, um, but you can adopt some of the principles. Whenever I first developed ours, I actually um, asked World Vision for their performance evaluations, and then I used some of the broad categories um, for that. So um, 
so this uh, is a sample performance evaluation um, from a fairly large uh, Christian organization and they have scorecards. Um, I think this one's mine, right? Or, or did you provide this one? No, you did. Okay, yeah. So um, the idea, and this is pretty common in performance evaluations, there's four levels. There's unsatisfactory, satisfactory. Um, you know, 80% or 70% might fall in, in here. This will be your top, you know, 20, 30, 40%, depending on how generous you want to be. But exceptional in a lot of organizations is your top five or 10%. Like you can't give everyone exceptional. Um, and, and, you know, they, they define these. And then um, they have something called, and we haven't talked about 360 evaluation, um, but, and you can uh, look this up, but the idea behind 360 evaluation um, is that um, you get uh, feedback, not just from your supervisor, but often from your peers and people who report to you um, at, at times. And um, what, the, what I liked about their model is they had, and this is actually, you know, something that, that I copied is they, they had behavioral competencies um, and then technical competencies. And a lot of the behavioral competencies actually tied in the organizational values. Um, and then they did something from, they did a self-evaluation, a supervisor evaluation, and then they could have multiple people of their team, um, you know, give, give this. And this is uh, actually the core characteristics is where they tied into um, their, their values. And, and this is where they, they tied in there. And then they got uh, strengths, improvements, and development opportunities. This is where you'd put the goals. Um, and all this is tied to the scorecard. And then they had other areas that aren't directly tied to the, the scorecard. And then a summary. Um, so for City Vision, um, this is actually the model that, that, that we, we built from. Um, so we tied everything in very closely to our values. Um, so we had the first section, which is alignment with city visions, values, and processes. And we have different things that tie into our core values. So uh, spiritual integration ties into our, our Jesus value. Emotional healing ties into our Jesus value. Um, you know, our, our uh, second largest program is addiction counseling. So that's a, a big one. Uh, alignment of calling, you know, that ties into the justice and technology values. Um, technology skills and processes relates to the technology value. And then we have part of what's, if you look at this, we have very specific criteria where, you know, individuals who go through this, it's a rubric and it, you know, I'll get people who, um, you know, they, and, and usually what I find is people are either, um, have an overinflated or underinflated <laughs> view of themselves. But usually if someone, I, I rate them at, at a two, they might rate themselves as a one or a three, but I rarely get someone who, you know, I rate as a two who rates themselves as a four. Um, so all, all those are values related. And, um, and then we also have um, a whole area um, where we tie in, let me see if I can find this. Oh yeah, you, you can't see it here. But what I actually do for us is, is our job descriptions are written in a way where you can just directly score the, the various aspects of the job description. And then um, for the job description, essentially what I'm, uh, the criteria that we use is we basically say, you know, are you meeting, you know, the basic requirements? Are you above what, you know, typical peers would be, or would you be considered exemplary? Um, for that item. And that, that's how we do this. Now, this is what I would call a, a heavyweight evaluation. This takes a huge amount of work on all parties. And it's difficult to do, um, you know, and I, I look at some of these that are, that are you know, more lightweight. Um, and, and we have, you know, a lot of, of, of planning. So you can use that as a model. Um, this is the, an action plan that I, I think you kind of went over, right, Angie? Um, yeah. And basically, the idea is you'd have multiple goals. Um, and, and I like how, you know, mine, I build this into our evaluation. I kind of actually like your idea of let's do the evaluation first and then let's do an action plan. Um, and you might have some required criteria, um, like required corrective action that come out of the evaluation, but you're not having them create their, their, uh, personal development plan during right. the same time. Do you? Okay. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so I, I like that. Now, um, this is actually, it sounds like this is 
an employee giving feedback to the organization in addition to them self-evaluating? Can you explain how this is used? Sure, this is, first of all, I don't advocate, if you'd scroll down just a little bit, I think that there's probably too many things here. I don't know that I would have them answer all 13 of these. You could, it's a lot, but you certainly don't have to. The, um, the purpose of this is actually for them to give the organization feedback, not just a self score on them and how they're doing, but it's it partly, it, it's meant to tie in on a larger level. So what do you like most about your job what are, in your opinion, what are the three most important things you do in your job? That can be a critical eye opener <laughs> because if, if they think that the most important things that they do in their job, say they're in food services and the three most important things that they do have nothing to do with providing food services, that, that's something you wanna be aware of. Um, because here's the thing, a lot of people come to ministry organizations because they believe in the organization and what it stands for, but they're willing to take any job that they can do that's open, even if it's not what they wanna do forever or they hope to move elsewhere. That's not all bad, but it makes a huge difference in understanding and knowing that in terms of how you engage and work with that employee. Um, and if they think that the three most important things they do don't have to do with getting food out, and as a result, they don't get food out, that is an issue. If they think that the most important things they do don't have anything to do with getting food out, but they still get food out and they do a great job of getting food out, that's a different thing. It's not necessarily a negative thing. It is an awareness thing because they're most likely going to path in a way that is different than not getting the food out. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, that's okay. great. I think the other thing too, I just wanna say real quick is one of the questions I would always ask is, uh, number nine, in, um, what would enable you to do the best job you could possibly do? This question has over the years blown me away because I just get answers I never expect. For example, a file cabinet. That was an actual answer given once. I, if I just had a filing cabinet, I could really be organized. And I'm like, oh my gosh, that's such an easy fix. We can do that. So I think as you look through these things, you wanna kind of tie in and pick the ones that make sense to your organization and maybe even to the, to the overall strategic goals for that year, but to get enough feedback so that you can one, get a gauge on where people are and provide them uh, appropriate support. We talked about these a little bit earlier, Andrew, I think um, on the onboarding, but just making sure and defining what is expected of people in the first 90 days of employment um, in the first year or when they make a significant job change. And so they're assuming a new level of work. Yeah, what, what I really like about this one, whenever I, I saw this, and I, mean, I put so much work into creating ours, but then it's so much work to actually do. I look at this and I'm like, wow, I could do this fairly quickly, and especially for a 90 day evaluation. I, I have our um, you know, new staff, I just have them do a self-evaluation because it'd be too much work if I had to do, a, you know, cause it, it can take hours, you know, to do, fill out some of these evaluations. This is something you could do in, you know, a lot less than an hour probably, right? So, and- That would be the idea. It, it becomes <laughs> a, a good conversation because part of what I realize is, um, you know, it, it's, more important that it get done than yes. that you have the best you know eight page form in the world um and and you know part of what i need to think about is how can i combine some of these principles that, that you're doing so andy this has been great i think this is great. um you know really helpful and you know the idea is all these things we've done up to now would help prevent um, what we're going to talk about next week, which is, you know, what happens whenever you have significant employee problems and, and separation. And um, yeah, so this is, this has been very helpful. Thanks a lot, Angie. Thank you. Okay.